to everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Quest and um, I've taught at various colleges, most recently at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, where I teach history and Africana studies. And I'm a scholar of the legacies of CLR James and particularly his ideas on direct democracy and how those ideas filter down to the Caribbean New Left, particular Cecil and Lloyd's generation, um, and the many different groupings in the archive of the Caribbean radical tradition, their political thought that has been neglected pointing in this direction. Um, today, when I say I'm gonna speak about the historical failure of anti-imperialism, obviously I wanna stir critical thinking, and I wanna talk a little bit about the recent challenges in Barbuda um, in light of the, the post-colonial independence condition in the Caribbean and then raise certain questions for our audience. Um, most people I think understand that around 2017, there was Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Irma uh, caused a lot of trouble in the Caribbean, particularly in Puerto Rico but also in Barbuda. And Barbuda is a smaller, well, they're both small territories. Barbuda and Antigua are a federated country in the Eastern Caribbean. Antigua is um, at this time about 100,000 people. And Barbuda before the hurricane was about 2,000 people. And they're struggling to get back to 2,000 people in the islands of Barbuda. So whether we feel uncomfortable calling Barbuda some kind of nation, obviously it's hard at 2000, but we can look at some of the ideas of the, you know, the small territory that has tremendous capacities and the city state model that has often been used to talk about Caribbean possibilities. And what has happened in Barbuda is following um, aid to try to uh, deal with the refugee problem after the great storm, there has been a general attack on the Barbuda people from the Antigua prime minister and the cultural apparatus around, uh, around Mr. Prime Minister Gaston Brown. And what has happened is the Barbuda people have had a history of communal land tenure that goes back to uh, post-slavery post times. And the government has tried to discredit this tradition of communal land tenure. And this tradition of communal land tenure is not um, a modern communism. It is something closer to what in other territories in the Caribbean we've called, uh, sometimes it's called Susu or Len Han, where there's a a, collect, a cooperative uh, spirit in both um, distributing land and making sure that everyone has access to land for a homestead that they don't have to pay for. They of course have to build their homes, some taxation. But in any event, there has been a move by, if you wish to call it this, the neoliberal Brown government to enclose the commons on Barbuda, to create new laws that basically contain the people in Barbuda so they cannot use the land to farm and fish as they please. There have been attacks on the Barbuda fisheries industry. And um, there has been an attempt to make international development agreements with people who want to build all-inclusive hotels on the other side of the island and allocate land to them without the Barbuda Council's consent. There's been an attempt to build an airport um, without the consent and that has disrupted the, fa the fauna and flora and the ecology on the island. I could go on, 
and people, I have written some things about it. Um, the, I think one of the best writers about it is the former uh, early editor of the outlet publication out of, you know, Tim Hector's Antigua Caribbean Liberation Movement, Alvet Ellertson Jeffers, sometimes known as Jeff, sometimes known as Ellertson. He has been the one consistently writing and recording about what's going on there from a critical perspective. Um, the issue at hand is that we have people in the Antiguan government from the prime minister to his advisors. The prime minister is a transparent capitalist who has manipulated the local laws to become wealthy off real estate and banking and put that wealth in his personal hands. At the same time, he has people around him talking variations of socialism, African nationalism, reparations, uh, connecting him up with CARICOM. And it's clear that every pan-Caribbean, pan-African socialist sentiment is hostile to the toiling people of Barbuda, okay? Now, do I think that's unique? to the Antigua and Barbuda situation? No, not in observing Trinidad or Guyana or Jamaica. There, there is a widespread problem that a cultural apparatus of individuals with these ideologies um, serve to advise transparent capitalist politicians in the region who are openly attacking Caribbean toilers. Um, so then this raises a question because I think it's part of Caribbean national culture to be anti-imperialist. Of course, there are people that are more pretenders and there are people that are more serious, but certainly in the national press, it's understood the history of the Caribbean territories as having been subordinated by British imperialism and elsewhere. Um, perhaps not as stridently critical of American empire as we would like. But there's this question that if we have a critique of neoliberalism and it's so widespread, why is the critique of neoliberalism overwhelmingly pro-capitalist, not just in the Caribbean region, but on a world scale? This is a question I'm asking because the, if neoliberalism is concerned with privatization and the logic of the free market, the critics of neoliberalism would like more public and nationalized property. And they have a kind of welfare state of mind. They would like to, in their wildest imagination, expand the welfare state, but None of, very few of the critics of neoliberalism or people who would rather have more public and nationalized property are openly saying the ordinary people should occupy, invade, and control the means of production themselves. Certainly, it's not something that I have to manufacture in my head because in the archive of the Caribbean radical tradition, many people have advocated this before. And there's an archive of strategies and documents and journals that have talked about this. But the problem is anti-imperialism, as Ryan suggested, can blur the line between a search for national sovereignty or national purpose politics when it also clashes with the the striving for coordination of the region from a point of view of workers' self-emancipation and Caribbean Federation from below. And so what we have with all these diagnostic studies of political economy is we tend to share economic thought with the prime ministers and the governments in the region. People could object to that. They could say, well, I don't share thought with these neoliberal politicians. I mean, I've advised them, I wish we would have more public and nationalized property, but that's the thing. People are advising them. They see the regional governments as somehow strategic partners in anti-imperialism. They do not see 
the commoners in Barbuda with the traditional communal land tenure as their partners. In fact, they allow people who associate themselves with all types of progressive ideologies and institutions to degrade the legitimacy of the communal traditions of the Barbudan people. You see, they talk about them as economically unviable. They talk about them as lazy. They talk about their communal traditions as a myth. Well, all communal traditions, modern or further in the past, can be improved upon. And dialogue and solidarity might advance the insurgent and direct democratic qualities of communal traditions. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is the anti-imperialist heritage is a loyal opposition to states and ruling classes in the region today. Now, let me say a little bit about direct democracy because direct democracy is not participatory democracy. It's not reconcilable with electoral politics for a minority to rule above society, however progressive. Direct democracy is a new form of government where workplace councils and popular assemblies directly govern. And then if you're gonna have a federation of those forms, you can have a Caribbean federation from below. But it makes no sense if we don't see that professional intellectuals or professional administrators need to be abolished as the embodiment of culture and government. And why do I say this? Because does anybody think CARICOM is advancing anti-imperialism today? Is, is CARICOM the highest stage of Caribbean Federation? And what type of social class of people, you know, gather at CARICOM meetings? You know, we need to talk about that because we cannot share collaborative spaces with the administrators of neocolonialism. And, we, and that's, we have to talk plainly about that. And if empire is the military domination, economic exploitation, and cultural subordination of one nation by a foreign power, is there any anti-imperialist movement or even ideas that is talking about opposing the United States today? Venezuela is not articulating that. Cuba is not articulating that, okay? So why is that? Because the state capitalist and nationalized forms, no one talks about this, are invested in by foreign governments and houses of finance. So if we're gonna reject neoliberal extractivism and see the alternative as public and nationalized property, right? Then what we're really making partnerships with is global houses of finance, also still, right? And multinational corporations and other governments. So we need to think about how direct democracy and anti-imperialist economics sometimes are in conflict, but sometimes can be reconciled to advance the struggle. Let me add another point. You know, we're, we gather in the tradition of Walter Rodney. One of the great things to admire about Walter Rodney is that he was an insurgent activist against the post-independence po Black political class. In 1968, that was so in Jamaica when he lost his life in 1980 in Guyana, that was also so. At the same time, um, I don't think that's the legacy that most people identify in the region with Walter Rodney today. I think there is something about how Europe underdeveloped Africa that taught people, many people have read it in college, that many prime ministers Many administrators of the Caribbean Soilers' lives are sympathetic to what he said there. Is it that they don't know how to read? Is it that the, the, there are more than one interpretation of the book? 
surely in Africa, Yoweri Museveni and uh, Robert Mugabe thought it was a nice book, right? It didn't stop them from um, maintaining property relations. So we have to look at the fact that our Caribbean anti-imperialists are advising states and ruling classes above society or people pretending to be that. We have a anti-imperialist perspective that in fact, it does want to be on certain terms, partners with global capital. And we have people that think in these terms, siding with capitalist politicians in the region who degrade the communal traditions of Caribbean toilers, okay? So those conflicting tendencies are right before us and I think we need to address them. You know, one of the connections between the Antigua situation, Antigua and Barbuda and Guyana, but perhaps in other territories in Trinidad and Jamaica as well, is every time young people look for the radical tradition in the country that points to direct democracy, the kind of perspective that used to question what people used to call doctor politics, or one manism, that tradition has evaporated or disappeared. The elders who know about it clearly are not teaching it, you see? And so that heritage has been lost. The reparations discourse, which appears to be some type of anti-imperialist discourse, is not disturbing Britain or the United States, but it, it likes to pretend, right? Um, it, it creates a situation where, as, as Cecil said at the very beginning, the perception of national liberation is at one time the Caribbean people owns their own development. But the discourse of anti-imperialism and the discourse of what today people call racial capitalism, let's face it, has united Caribbean socialists and Caribbean capitalists in a united front that was not so in 1968. It was not so in 1970. It was not so in 1983, you see? So when we have reparations as a touchstone, we're saying the abolition of slavery in the region was roughly 1833. Some say 1834, maybe in another territory, a couple of years later. No one is talking about 1968, 1970, or 1974 as a weapon against the Black political class in the region. And that means the critique of neocolonialism is a fraud. It's something that can be placed in partnership with the black capitalist politicians in the region. When we place ourselves with this class in the region, we place solidarity there, people get lost. They say, well, we would like to express solidarity with the region, but who do we identify with in the region today? And someone like Gaston Brown gives a speech like he's actually a dignified human being, like he's not an exploiter of the Caribbean working people. And the socialists in that country, formerly associated with Tim Hector's movement, they're with Gaston Brown. And in Guyana, the people associated with WPA, they had linked themselves up, you know, in the Op New Coalition in recent years with the, ant, the, um, the people associated with the older PNC government that actually killed Walter Rodney. So this disturbs not young people who are short of consciousness, it disturbs even young and middle-aged people who can read, who can pay attention. For those that can read and pay attention and do have a consciousness, what do we attach ourselves to? Where is the leap from what we learned from 1968, 1970, right? 
to today. I don't know why we're talking about 1833. Why aren't we talking about the turning point of 1970 today? You see, the, the, the struggle against the Black political class that claims to be progressive, that could mouth anti-imperialism, that could say neo-colonialism was a problem. Who will say that this class of people today are not partners in the anti-imperialist project? So I'll stop there and I ask you to consider some of the concerns I raised today. Thank you very much.